Hello and welcome to the School of Art and Design shop safety video. This video provides an overview of the shop facilities as well as instruction on the safe and proper use of some of the tools and equipment you'll be using in the shop. You are encouraged to take notes as you will be allowed to use them on the safety test you'll be taking following the video. Please have your receipt for the shop safety test fee ready as well as a pen and your notes when you take the test. Now sit back and enjoy the video. Hi. The first thing I want to show you today is the tool room. The tool room is where you're going to come to check tools out to complete your projects. And in here we have all of the drill bits, the blades you'll use for the table saw, we've got rulers, compasses, protractors, eye protection, hearing protection. This is where you're going to come to get all of those things that you need to complete your projects with. So once uh, you've checked your tools out, you'll be going back into the uh, main shop. Now let's take a look at the tools that are in our main shop out here. Out here we have a table saw, we have a band saw, we have a shaper, a joiner, and a compound miter saw. And let's take a look back here in the sanding room. The reason we wanted to show you the sanding room is Back here we have a backdraft hood, and this is an excellent place to be sanding with portable equipment like this belt sander, a random orbit sander, or a pad sander. When you're sanding with this equipment, it produces a lot of sawdust. The backdraft hood will pull that sawdust away from you so you're not breathing it. Also back here we have a stroke sander, which is excellent for sanding long pieces of wood on the top, and also plywood and flat material on the bottom. Also in this room we have two vertical belt sanders which are excellent for sanding not only wood but plastic materials. And we also have a drum sander and a horizontal boring machine. Now let's take a look at the rest of the equipment in the shop we just came from. We have a drill press, we also have a disc sander, and we have two band saws here that are set up for cutting both wood and plastics. We also have another disc sander, a vertical spindle sander, and a panel saw, which is good for cutting plywood and large sheet goods. We also have a horizontal sanding machine here. Now I'd like to introduce you to Jordan Shepard, who will take you on a tour of the rest of our shops. Thanks, Steve. Over on this side of the shop, we have a scroll saw for making intricate cuts in wood. We have a heavy duty drill press with a low range for making large holes. We have a pair of buffers for both plastics and metals. Here we have another table saw with a nice large table for cutting big pieces of wood. Down here we have a shaper table. Over on this side, we have a pair of wood lathes. These machines can be used to turn projects in both wood and foam. Here we have a planer, an additional drill press, and a large bandsaw, excellent for cutting oversized pieces of wood. Back here, we have a radial arm saw with 16 inch blade. This machine can cut stock up to four inches thick. Over here we have another bandsaw, a vertical spindle sander, and a horizontal drum sander with conveyor belt. The last machine over on this side of the shop is our high speed vertical belt sander. This machine's excellent for deburring metal parts. And speaking of metal, next on the tour I'd like to show you our machine shops. This is our machine shop. Here we have a three axis Bridgeport mill with digital readouts. This machine is used for making precise cuts in both metal and plastic. We have a low speed metal cutting bandsaw, as well as a Kalamazoo horizontal bandsaw. Over here we have our Cadillac machine lathe. This tool can be used to machine both metal and plastic. And back here we have our South Bend lathe, a smaller version of the Cadillac. Over on this side of the room, we have another bridge port with digital readouts. Now I'd like to take you across the hall and show you our clean assembly area. Mm -hmm. 
This is our clean assembly area. We ask that you don't sand or cut anything in this room to keep that, the dust down. We have a few more tools. This is a bender for bending both tubing and rod. This is a metal brake for bending sheet metal products. And over here, we have the spray booth. This is our spray booth. We have flammable cabinets in the corners for storing all of your flammable materials, as well as a variety of waste disposal drums. This is an area that you can test out your spray gun. This is the switch for the spray booth. By turning it on, fresh air is drawn through the window and back here to the arrestor pads. This is the actual spray booth itself where you'll be painting your products. Place your projects on this table or Lazy Susan and remember, spray towards the arrestor pads. That way any overspray will get stuck in the pads and you won't inhale it. Now let's go back out here and I'll show you a few more of our tools. Out here we have our V-nailer for assembling wooden picture frames, our Fletcher mat cutter for making precise cuts in mat board. On this table we have an assortment of paper cutters. Here we have our APM thermoformer for vacuforming parts out of various types of sheet plastic. And back here in the corner we have a sandblaster. Now let's take a look at the tools in here. In here we have our welding station. We have facilities for both gas and TIG welding. Over here we have a notcher for cutting notches out of sheet metal products. We have a vertical wet belt sander, excellent for sanding both plastics and glass. And back here we have a few more sheet metal forming tools. This is a slip roller for curving sheet metal. And this is a circle shear for cutting circular shapes out of sheet metal products. We also have a spot welder and a hot wire for cutting shapes out of styrofoam. Now I'd like to turn you over to Steve Carlson in the tool crib who's going to show you how to check out tools using your student body card. Thanks, Jordan. In order to check tools out from the tool room, you'll need to have your current ID card and pass the test which we're going to be taking at the end of this video today. Remember, this is where you're going to be checking out all of the tools you need to finish your projects here in the shop. Also, if you uh, have a problem with the machine, a bandsaw blade breaks, or the machine's making a funny noise, be sure and let us know so that we can fix the problem. Now that we've finished the tour of the shop, we're going to take a look at a series of segments that go over the safe and proper operation of the equipment in the shop. To do that, I'm going to be joined by my colleagues Jordan Shepard and Jennifer Wu. Please remember, food, drinks, bicycles, and skateboards are not allowed in the shop. Closed-toed shoes must be worn at all times. Also, please refrain from using cell phones, earbuds, or headphones while you are in the shop. When you're working with tools or power equipment in the shop, it's important to wear eye protection. Regular eyeglasses or sunglasses are not adequate eye protection. We provide safety glasses like these that can be worn over your glasses, or face shields like these, which will give you full face protection. Also, when you're working in the shop, if you have a question about a piece of equipment, make sure you ask your instructor or the technician and the tool room staff can also provide you with instruction manuals on the equipment. Now let's take a look at the uh, table saw. The table saw is one of the most commonly used pieces of equipment in any wood or plastic shop. It is used to cut lumber, plywood, plastics, masonite, particle board, and a number of materials. It's made to do straight, accurate cuts in these materials. When you come out to the table saw, if you find a blade on the saw, that means the saw is in use. We normally don't keep blades on the machine. So if there is a blade on the machine, it means the machine is being used. And you should wait until a person using the machine is finished. We keep all of our saw blades in the tool room because there are different types of blades to do different types of cuts. There are blades specifically made to do rip cuts on lumber, 
which means to cut with the grain of the wood. There are cross-cut blades that are meant to cut across the grain. There are also combination blades which will do either cut. In addition, there are blades designed to specifically cut materials like plastics, plywood, and particle board. There are also dado blades that are used to make grooves from a quarter inch up to an inch in width. If you are unsure which blade to use for your project, ask your instructor or the tool room staff for advice. Most of the blades in our shop are carbide tipped. The teeth on these blades are brazed onto the steel blade because the carbide will stay sharp longer. Although these teeth are hard, they are also brittle and can chip easily if placed on a hard surface like the cast iron top of the table saw. Once you've checked a blade out from the tool room, bring it out to the saw and place it on a surface where the blade won't be damaged, either on top of the rip fence or on a piece of wood. And before you install a blade on the table saw, you need to make certain that the power has been turned off to the machine. In the corner of the room is a power panel. At the top, it's marked table saw 12 and 14. If you come down on the right-hand side, you'll see breakers 12 and 14. Just make sure those have been turned off. When you come back to the saw, it's a good idea to make sure the power has been turned off to the machine. Just check the stop-start switch to make sure it doesn't come on. To install a blade, Lift up on the blade guard and move it aside. Then push down at the back of the insert plate that's on the table and remove that. Then on the inside, you're going to see an arbor with a nut and a washer. Remove the nut and the washer. And remember, this is a left-hand thread, so it turns counterclockwise to remove it. When you put the blade on, put the blade on with the teeth at the top pointing towards you. The blade will be rotating in this direction. And when you put the blade in the saw, be careful not to uh, bounce it off the top of the table or off the top of the arbor because you can chip the teeth. Slide it onto the arbor. Put the washer on with the crown out towards the nut. And then put the nut back on and hand tighten it. Once that's tight, you can either use a board or a blade lock to hold the blade while you're tightening the blade. With a blade lock, you raise the blade, put the blade lock on, put the wrench on, and push the wrench away from you. Just in front of the blade, is a splitter, and the splitter keeps the wood from binding the blade as you're making a cut. And for several cuts um, that you do on the table saw, you will not need to use a splitter. Uh, for instance, when you're making a dado cut where you're making just a groove in a piece of wood, you're not actually cutting all the way through the piece of wood. So you'll need to take the splitter out. Also, if you're using a sliding table, you will need to take the splitter out. And to do that, you pull a knob to the left and then just pull a splitter straight out of the uh, saw. But for most cuts, um, typically the uh, rip cut and cross cuts, you will be using the splitter. So leave it in the saw for this cut. Now that the blade has been installed, you can reinsert the insert plate in the table. Slide the guard back over the blade and lower it down over the blade. And you're ready to make your first cut. The blade guard or splitter must not be removed without the consent of your instructor or the technician and must be reinstalled as soon as you have finished a cut where you have taken it off. Once the blade has been installed, adjust the blade so that it is about a quarter inch above the material that you are cutting. The hand wheel at the back of the saw allows you to raise and lower the blade. First unlock the small knob in the center of the hand wheel about a quarter of a turn before you make your adjustment. When you're using the table saw, you must always use a guide to push the material through the table saw, either a rip fence, a miter guide, sliding table. And the work you're pushing through has to have at least one straight edge. And when you're pushing the material through the saw, you use the longest side of the material to guide it through the saw. The first cut we're going to be doing is a rip cut. And to use a rip cut, 
You're going to use the rip fence, which slides back and forth on this rear rail. And on the rear rail, there's a measuring uh, tape. And you can set the guide and lock it in place with a knob at the back of the rip fence to measure the distance between the rip fence and the inside of the blade. When you make the rip cut, make sure that the straight edge is against the rip fence. Push the material all the way through and past the blade. This is important to do. If you don't push the material all the way through and past the blade, the material can be bound between the blade and the rip fence and be kicked back towards you. When you are making a rip cut that is narrower than four inches, you should use a push stick to push the material through the blade. Remember the piece that is being pushed is the one between the rip fence and the blade. The push sticks are available from the tool room. The next cut we're going to make is a bevel cut. There's a hand wheel on the side of the machine that allows you to tilt the blade up to 45 degrees and a protractor at the rear of the saw that tells you what angle the blade is at. Unlock the small knob in the center of the hand wheel about a quarter turn before making the adjustment. If you are making a rip cut with the blade at an angle, be certain to move the rip fence to the left of the blade so that you do not trap material under the blade and against the rip fence. This can cause material to be kicked back towards you and can be very dangerous. The next cut we're going to make is a cross cut. To make a cross cut, you can either use a miter guide or a sliding table. Uh, the sliding table is like using a large miter guide. To use a miter guide, Put it in the slot in the top of the table, or two slots in the table. And the miter guide can be adjusted to almost any angle, up to 45 degrees, and on this miter guide, actually up to 90. To lock it in place, just turn the handle at the top, place the material against the miter guide, and push it through the blade and make your cut. And we'll make a cut. Before removing material next to the blade, make sure the blade has come to a complete stop. To use a sliding table, you will need to remove the splitter and move the guard out of the way. So the first thing you'll want to do is turn the power off. Lower the blade into the table. Remove the insert plate and the splitter. Put the insert plate back in the table. Move the rip fence to the side and then you can put on the sliding table. When using the sliding table, you have to make sure that the stop on the back isn't in conflict with the guard, and the guard can be moved back and forth. Also, you're going to readjust the height of the blade for the thickness of the table so that the blade comes up above the material about a quarter of an inch. Set the stop for the size you want. Then hold the material on both sides of the blade and push it through and then pull it back towards you as soon as the cut is made. Don't forget to turn the power back on.
Another cut that can be made on the table saw is a dado cut. And a dado cut is actually a process of making a groove in your material. It's often used in furniture making and cabinet making. And to do that, the first thing you're going to need to do is take out the table insert because we're going to use an insert that will accommodate a wider blade. And the dado blade will cut from between a quarter inch and one inch. Also, since you're not cutting all the way through the material, you're simply putting a groove in the material, you need to remove the splitter. Once you've taken those off the machine, take the nut and the washer off, and the dado blades are basically a stack of blades that are put onto the arbor, and they're marked this side out for the one that will go towards the outside of the stack. So this will be the last one on. There are a series of scraper blades and washers. And a little chart that will show you how to stack these to get a particular width. When you put these on, make certain that the carbide is not touching the side of the steel blade. And when you're using a dado blade, do not use the washer. Use just the nut. And when you put a dado blade on, make certain that the nut is as tight as you can get it. Once you've put the blades on the saw, go ahead and put this insert plate back in. And also move the guard back into place over the blade. Once you've got the blade on, you can go ahead and make your cut. And when you make a dado cut, you can use the miter guide, the rip fence, and we also have a special sliding table for making dado cuts. A dado cut is, is good for making a lap joint like this in a piece of furniture. It's also good for making grooves in uh, material for shelving. And to do a dado cut, you adjust it to the depth you want. And with a miter guide, you simply push it through the blade. It is important when you install a dado blade to have either your instructor or the technician check your setup. When you're finished, uh, you'll need to remove the blade from the table saw and take it back to the tool room. And to do that, you need to lift up on the blade guard, slide it away so you can get down into the uh, machine, press down at the back of the insert plate and remove this from the saw. And then use the wrench, and you can either use a small stick against the uh, blade, or you could use the blade lock, which we showed you before. And just pull the wrench towards you about a quarter turn. That'll be enough to loosen the nut. And then take the nut and the washer off. Remember, this is a left-hand thread, so it's going to turn clockwise. Then slide the blade off and carefully remove it from the saw and put the washer and the nut back on the arbor. And then put the blade insert back in the machine. Remember to return the blade to the tool room and clean up as soon as you are finished. Remember, the table saw is used to make straight accurate cuts in wood, plastics, plywood, particle board, and other sheet goods. It can do rip cuts, cross cuts, miter and bevel cuts, and dado cuts. This is the drill press. It is used to drill accurate holes in a variety of materials. There are many options as to the type of drill bits that may be used. There are general purpose twist bits that will drill holes in wood, metals, and plastics, as well as rigid foam products. We also have bits that are designed to drill holes just in wood 
and others that are just for plastics. If you are unsure what type of drill bit to use, ask your instructor or the shop technician for advice. Before inserting a bit in the drill press chuck, make certain that the speed has been correctly adjusted for the drill bit size and for the material that you are drilling. The general rule of thumb is the larger the drill bit and the harder the material, the slower the speed to use. Next to every drill press is a speed chart that indicates the speed the drill bit should be turning when drilling different types of materials. To adjust the speed of the drill press, the machine must be running. Turn the machine on by using the chuck key that is located just above the on switch. Then turn the variable speed control handle to the desired speed. After the drilling speed has been adjusted and the machine has been turned off, you can mount the drill bit in the chuck. To do this, spin the collar on the chuck so the jaws open enough to allow the bit to be inserted. Then hand tighten the chuck by turning the chuck collar in the opposite direction. Use the chuck key to tighten the bit securely. Make sure to adjust the table on the drill press so that the material you drill is within one inch of the drill bit. To adjust, first loosen the table lock lever and then raise or lower it by turning the handle. Afterwards, be sure to retighten the lock lever. There is also a depth stop on the right side of the machine that allows you to adjust how deep the drill bit will drill. This is adjusted by lifting the upper ring and spinning the lower collar to the appropriate setting. Be sure that you place a piece of scrap wood under the material you are drilling so that you don't drill a hole into the drill press table. If you are drilling an average size hole in an average size piece of material, it is normally okay to simply hold the material down by hand and drill. However, if you are drilling a large hole or are drilling into a piece that is difficult to hold down, the material should be clamped down onto the drill press table. This is extremely important when drilling holes in thin material like sheet metal or plastics because the drill bit will sometimes bind and spin the material around on the bit, which can result in severe cuts to your hands and fingers. When drilling holes in small pieces of material, use a drill press vise or clamp. Do not hold the material down with your hand. It is extremely important to tie back long hair and secure loose clothing when operating a drill press or any machine with moving parts. Remember, the drill press is used for drilling accurate holes in a variety of materials. There are several types of drill bits available and you should ask your instructor or the shop technician for advice on the proper selection. It is extremely important to have the drill press running when adjusting the speed of the machine. Be sure to adjust the table so that your workpiece is within an inch of the drill bit and place a piece of scrap wood under your work so you don't drill a hole into the table. When drilling large holes or drilling holes in material that is difficult to hold, be sure to clamp it down to the table or use a clamp or table vise to hold the work rather than using your fingers. It is extremely important to tie back long hair and secure loose clothing or jewelry that may get caught in the machine. When you are finished, return the drill bit to the tool room and clean up your area. This is the bandsaw. It is used for making both straight and curved cuts. In the wood shops, bandsaws are set to cut wood, plastics, and soft aluminum. In the machine shop, the bandsaw is set to cut ferrous metals like steel and iron. When making cuts on the bandsaw, you have several options for guiding the material through the blade. 
You can tilt the table up to 45 degrees. You can use a miter guide. You can use a rip fence, or you can make freehand cuts. Before making any cuts, the blade guide should be adjusted to approximately a quarter inch above the work. To tilt the table, the two lock knobs under the table must be loosened about a half turn each. The table can then be tilted to any angle up to 45 degrees. There is a protractor at the front of the machine that can help you adjust to the angle you'd like. To use a miter guide, simply place it in the slot that you see on the table. Then hold your material against the miter guide and push the material through and beyond the blade. Another guide that may be used on the bandsaw is the rip fence. The rip fence gives you a cut parallel to the edge you place against it. To use, slide the rip fence onto the rails, tighten the lock knob at the rear, and proceed with your cut. To get a straight cut, keep your material pressed firmly against the fence as you push it through and beyond the blade. The most common cut that the bandsaw is used for is the freehand cuts. This gives you the ability to cut virtually any curved shape. When making freehand cuts on the bandsaw, be certain that the blade you are using is the proper width for the cut you are making. If you are making a straight cut, you should use the widest blade possible. If you are cutting a curved shape, use a blade that will not bind as you make the cut. The narrower the blade, the smaller the radius you can cut with, and the sharper the curve. A quarter inch blade will cut a one and a half inch or larger diameter, and a three eighth inch blade will cut a three inch or larger diameter. Be sure to keep your hands out of the blade path when cutting material. The safest and easiest way to do this is to keep your hands on either side of the blade rather than in direct line with it. This is especially important when cutting wood that may split or break near the end of a cut. It is also important not to pull the material back towards you when the machine is running. This may pull the blade off the wheels. Stop the machine before removing your material and if need be, back it off the blade gently. When you are using a bandsaw, the material should always be moving away from you while the machine is running. Remember, the bandsaw can be used to make both straight and curved cuts. In the wood shops, the bandsaws are set to cut wood, plastics, and soft aluminum. In the machine shop, the bandsaw is set to cut ferrous metals like steel and iron. Remember, the blade guide should be adjusted to be approximately a quarter inch above your work. This provides more support for the thin blade and allows the blade guard to have greater coverage. Remember that round stock or stock with an uneven bottom must be clamped or supported so that they will not move while being cut. Remember that if you want to tilt the table, first loosen the lock knobs a half turn each beneath it. When you are finished, return the table to its original position and re-lock. Cutting small radiuses requires that you use a blade that is narrower so that it doesn't bind while you are cutting. It is important to avoid standing to the right of the machine. If a blade breaks, it normally comes out of the machine in this direction and may injure you. Remember to keep the material moving away from you while the saw is running so you don't pull the blade off the wheels. And most important, when you are using the bandsaw, know where your hands are in relationship to the blade at all times. Keep them out of direct line with the blade. This is the vertical belt sander. The vertical belt sander is used for sanding both wood and plastics and is primarily used for doing finish sanding. It is especially good for doing finish sanding on wood because the abrasive moves in a straight line and allows you to sand with the grain of the wood. A reminder, when sanding on any machine that uses an abrasive belt or disc, do not sand plaster, paint, or any material that will clog the abrasive. 
The vertical belt sander table can be adjusted to 45 degrees. And the table has a slot for using a miter guide, just like the one on the table saw. Never sand thin pieces of material that may become wedged between the belt and the table. This can be dangerous and may damage the machine and your work. Never wear gloves when operating machinery, especially sanders like this one that can pull the glove and your hand into the machine. Never wear loose clothing when operating machinery, especially sanders like this. To reiterate, the vertical belt sander is used for sanding both wood and plastic, but is primarily used for finished sanding, especially on wood because you can sand with the grain of the wood. The vertical belt sander table tilts to 45 degrees and has a slot that can be used for a miter guide. Remember, never sand thin stock that may become wedged between the table and the sanding belt, and never wear gloves or loose clothing that may get caught in this machine. This is the disc sander. The disc sander is an excellent tool for doing rough shaping and sanding of material. It can be used on wood and plastics and most metals. It should not be used to sand materials like plaster, paint, or any material that will clog the abrasive. When sanding on a disc sander, it is important to sand only on the downward turning side of the disc. If you sand on the upward turning side of the disc, the work and the sawdust will be thrown upward. It is also important to hold the work securely on the table. Do not attempt to sand work freehand. Never sand thin stock that may become wedged between the table and the disc. Never wear gloves when operating tools, especially the disc sander where a glove could mean the loss of a finger rather than just a scratch. Feed the stock into the disc with moderate speed and pressure. Remember, keep your fingers away from the disc. To tilt the table, you must first loosen the table lock knob. Before attempting to tilt the table, you must release the table stop lever. If not released, this could damage the table tilting mechanism. The table can be tilted up to 45 degrees in either direction. The table also has a slot for a miter guide, just like on the vertical belt sander and the table saw. The table can also be raised and lowered. This allows you to use more or less of the abrasive surface. Remember, the disc sander is a good tool for sanding and shaping wooden plastics and most metals. Remember, though, never sand plaster, paint, or materials that will clog the abrasive disc. Also, never wear gloves and keep loose clothing away from the spinning disc. Never sand thin stock that may become wedged between the table and the disc. And when adjusting the table angle, the lock knob and table stop lever must be released. Most importantly, when working on the disc sander, remember to always work on the downward turning side of the disc and always keep the work supported by the table. This is the spindle sander. The spindle sander is used for sanding concave shapes in wood, plastics, and most metals. It should not be used to sand paint, plaster, or any material that will clog the abrasive. The spindle sander has spindles from a quarter inch diameter to four inches in diameter. When choosing a spindle, pick one that is as close to the radius you are sanding as possible. To adjust the table, you must first release the table lock knob. Tilt the table up slightly to release pressure on the table stop lever. Lower the stop lever and adjust the table to the angle desired. After you have set your angle, tighten the table lock knob. To reset the table so that it is at 90 degrees to the spindle, first loosen the table lock knob, crank the table back up so that it passes the zero degree mark on the protractor, raise the table stop lever, and lower the table so that it hits the stop lever. Now tighten the table lock knob. To install a spindle, carefully lower the spindle into the hole in the top of the machine. Never drop it in. You could damage the threads on the bottom of the spindle. Once the spindle is in place, hand tighten it by turning the spindle clockwise. Then use the wrenches hanging next to the machine to tighten the spindle. 
Do not over tighten the spindle into the machine. It needs only to be snug. Over tightening can damage the spindle and make it impossible to remove. If you are using a spindle smaller than 4 inches, you should use one of the four insert plates to make up the space between the spindle and the table. When sanding on the spindle sander, it is safest to have the work supported by the table. When pushing work into the spindle, move the work against the rotation of the spindle. This will keep the work from being pulled out of your hands. Never attempt to place a piece of work over the spindle or remove it while a machine is running. To reiterate, the spindle sander is an excellent machine for sanding concave shapes in wood, plastics, and most metals. When installing a spindle, be careful not to damage the threads of the spindle by dropping it into the machine or by over tightening with the wrenches. If you are using a spindle smaller than four inches in diameter, you need to use an insert plate to take up the space between the table and the spindle. Always push material against the rotation of the spindle and keep the work flat on the table. Never attempt to place work over or remove work while a machine is running. This is extremely dangerous. This is the compound miter saw. The compound miter saw can make a variety of cuts. It can be used for cross-cutting stock to length. It can be used to cut both inside and outside miter cuts. And it can be used to make compound miter cuts. It is especially good for cutting frame and molding stock and can be used on both wood and plastic. It is an excellent machine to use if you are cutting several pieces of stock to the same length because the saw has a very accurate fence stop system. The miter saw has an adjustable handle that can be adjusted for ease of use. The handle can be rotated to four different positions, vertical, horizontal, or 45 degrees left or right. To adjust the handle, release the handle lock clamp and pull the handle release lever. Once the position has been set, relock the handle lock clamp. To start the machine, depress the safety switch on the handle and then squeeze the switch lever. This can be done with either your left or right hand. The table on the miter saw can be rotated both left and right up to 52 degrees. To do this, first loosen the miter lock knob, then lift and hold the miter detent lever until the desired angle is set. Then retighten the miter lock knob. The saw can also be adjusted to make compound miters. When making compound miters, check with your instructor or the technician to make sure your setup is safe. The widest board this saw will cut is 8 inches. The tallest board this saw can cut is 4 and a quarter inches. Inspect your workpiece before cutting. If workpiece is bowed or warped, clamp it with the outside bowed face towards the fence. Always make certain that there is no gap between the workpiece, fence, and table along the line of the cut. Bent or warped workpieces can twist or rock and may cause binding on the spinning saw blade while cutting. Also, Make sure there are no nails or foreign objects in the workpiece. Do not use the saw until the table is clear of all tools and wood scraps. Small debris or loose pieces of wood or other objects that contact the revolving blade can be thrown back at you. Do not feed the workpiece into the blade or cut freehand in any way. Your workpiece must be stationary and clamped or braced by your hand. The saw must be fed through the workpiece smoothly and at a rate which will not overload the saw's motor. Cut only one workpiece at a time. Multiple workpieces cannot be adequately clamped or braced and may bind on the blade or shift during cutting. Always use a clamp or a fixture designed to properly support round materials such as dowel rods or tubing. Rods have a tendency to roll while being cut, causing the blade to bite and pull the work with your hand into the blade. When cutting irregularly shaped workpieces, plan your work so it will not slip and pinch the blade and be torn from your hand. A piece of molding, for example, must lie flat or be held by a fixture or jig that will not let it twist, rock, or slip while being cut. Let the blade reach full speed before contacting the workpiece. If the workpiece or blade becomes jammed or bogged down, turn the miter saw off by releasing the switch. Wait for all moving parts to stop and unplug the miter saw, then work to free the jammed material. Continued sawing with jammed workpieces could cause loss of control or damage to the miter saw. Breaking action of the saw causes the saw head to jerk downward. Be ready for this reaction when making an incomplete cut 
or when releasing the switch before the head is completely in the down position. After finishing the cut, release the switch, hold the saw arm down, and wait for the blade to stop before removing your work. Reaching with your hand under a rotating blade is dangerous. There are additional safety instructions for particular operations of the saw in the manual located on the wall to the left of the machine. For chop action cutting, turn the saw on and lower the head assembly to make the cut. Release the switch and wait for the blade to completely stop before raising the head assembly and removing the workpiece. It is extremely important to know where your hands are in relationship to the blade. Cutting stocks shorter than six inches can be dangerous and should be avoided. Never place your hands near the cutting area. Keep your hands and arms outside of the no hand zone. Be aware of the path of the saw blade. You should make a dry run with the saw off to observe the projected path of the saw blade. Keep your hands outside of this path. With the saw running, a laser line is projected onto your workpiece. This line will be on the left side of the cut. After using the miter saw, reset the saw to its original position and remember to clean up your area. The compound miter saw can be used to make a variety of miter and compound miter cuts. If you have any questions about how to operate this machine, you should ask your instructor or the shop technician. There is also an operating manual located on the wall next to the machine. These are the nail and staple guns which we provide in the shop. These are real guns, so never point a nail or staple gun at anyone. There are several options when choosing a nail or staple gun. You should choose the gun that shoots the fastener best suited to the material you are fastening. Nails are best for wood. Staples are good for quick and strong fastening. Wide crown staples work well for fabric, paper, and light fastening. Each gun will shoot a variety of different length fasteners, so choose the correct length of fastener for the material you are working with. To load a nail or staple gun, first disconnect the gun from the air supply, holding onto the hose because the hose itself can be dangerous. Open the breech, place the fasteners in the gun, make sure they point downward, and close the breech. For nail guns with a follower type magazine, insert the nails in the bottom of the magazine. Next, retract the follower past the nails you just loaded. Allow the follower to return under spring pressure, pushing the nails securely into the top of the magazine. Check the regulator for the correct operating pressure. Most guns are labeled with their operating range. If you are unsure, Ask your instructor or the shop technician for assistance. Reconnect the gun to the air supply, being careful to point the gun towards the ground, and hold firmly onto the air hose. The gun is now ready to use. Here are some general warnings about the nail and staple guns. Always wear eye protection when using these tools. Never try to fire the tool unless it is pressed tightly against the work that is to be fastened. When connecting the tool to the airline, do not have your finger on the trigger. Always point the tool towards the floor, away from any part of your body or anyone else's. Never use your hand to back up a piece while firing the tool. Sometimes the tool will double strike, sending a nail right through the work and into your hand. Keep your hands outside the range of the fastener being used. Sometimes nails will deflect and go into your hand. Remember, there are several types of guns and fasteners. Be sure to pick the correct one for the job you are doing. Load the guns with the air disconnected. Remember, the air hose itself can be dangerous. Be sure to check the regulator for the proper pressure. Reconnect the air hose with the gun pointing towards the ground and keep your hands away from the fastening area. If you have trouble loading a nail or staple gun, consult the manual located in the gun's case or ask your instructor or the shop technician for assistance.